philosophy? Different point of view? Uh, similar experiences? Um, I actually had a very different experience. I was all certified. Um, an alternative certification in Kentucky meant to... Sorry. Um, meant that I walked in. I had been a retail manager for 10 years. I had an undergrad degree in general studies with a core in natural science. And over about three years, decided I did want to become a teacher. Walked in, applied, applied at U of L, and started teaching that fall. So, so it was scary, to say the least. I taught my first two years at one of the lowest performing schools, middle schools in Kentucky. for me was the amount of work that KTIP was, the internship program. And it was the checking of boxes and going through the forms and do you have this document? Did you put, you forgot this letter on this page? And it was entirely too much when even, you know, I had just walked in off the street basically. I needed to learn how to work with kids how to work with other educators. I needed to know how to set up a grade book. I needed to know, how do you grade? Okay, they got them all right. Well, how much does that really count? Uh, one of the best things that I did have was a retired teacher mentor. Um, I do believe that UofL and JCPS worked in, together. And having that retired teacher come in was a godsend. I mean, it was always after school, before school, she showed up one day and did all my filing for me. And it was little things like that, just to, the behind the scenes stuff that nobody ever thinks about. And I think we really need to look at doing. And personally, KTIP, whoever thought that it was a great idea to put it your first year teaching, wasn't ever a teacher. In my opinion, sorry. Well, no, that's very, very worth noting, especially following up Alex's comments earlier on that experience. Um, shifting the gear on the gears a bit on the recruitment and preparation of Robin, if uh, as a high achieving teacher, what strategies do you think would be effective in attracting more high achieving folks to the profession? Well, I think as teachers, we need to advocate for our own profession. We don't do a good job of that. Uh, the news media portrays us in a negative light, and you always get the news story about the teacher who has done something wrong. You rarely get the news story about the teachers who are doing something right. And so kids don't get that. And they may see you as a role model in the classroom, but since the society in general doesn't portray you as a profession that most kids want to aspire to, it's really hard to recruit kids who have lots of opportunities. And I think maybe a way to recruit high school kids or college kids is to have more mentor opportunities for high school kids in the classroom, perhaps where they're helping peers. We've begun that in our high school where we have um, opportunities for high school students to help in some of our classes. And I think if you have a passion for teaching, that gives kids the idea that, oh, I can do this. And I might really actually like to do this as a profession. Um, and I want to piggyback with something that um, Bucky said, and that giving student teachers in college more time in the classroom before they are truly certified as teachers, there's no substitute for that experience. None. We've had lots of student teachers who have completed four years of college, and they spend a week in the classroom, and they ditch because they can't take it, because they haven't had enough classroom experience before they get to that level where they're actually the one in charge and trying to come up with lesson plans. And um, I can think this last year, we had two student teachers, and I won't name the university they, they were from, but neither of them made it through the first month of student teaching. And that's a shame, because these people have devoted four years of undergraduate work, plus another year 
uh, graduate level work, and then they try to do their state teaching and don't make it. So to have those experiences earlier, if you're thinking about going into the teaching profession, I think would be really beneficial. So more time and sooner. Yeah. yeah. Um, Pat, either one of those questions in terms of your own experiences mm -hmm. and some of change or a strategy to bring more high achievers into the profession. My experience, and I'm very proud of where I got my degree, so I'm going to say I went to U of L, and um, a lot of the student teachers that I have have had a lot of time in the classroom. I know my experience, um, if you've been thinking about it, you took a class and you went in and to just to kind of get your feet wet. Is this really what I want? From that point forward, for instance, I, I got an elementary degree, the old, I'm a dinosaur, the old K to eight is my degree. Um, so when I took um, literacy, uh, kitty lit's what we called it, I was in the classroom and I was teaching a kitty lit class when I did math methods, I was in math class with, with a teacher, and I had to do this many hours. I had to do this many um, lesson plans. And when I got to the point where I was ready to student teach, I felt like I was pretty ready. I, I, I had a good experience. However, because I'm a dinosaur, there was no mentoring. There was no internship. It was, here's your classroom. Don't let the door hit you. Good luck. Let me know how that worked out for you. Sometimes I have books. We didn't even have a curriculum, honestly. It was, this is what, you, you just figure out what, what you're going to do with your kids. Well, it's good, I guess, um, to remember that serious progress has been made, right? <laughs> but I think, I think the model um, that, that they used in, in, you know, in the 70s, it, it was good. They're still doing that, and it, it's very effective, and I can tell when I get student teachers who have not gone through that format, they're seriously lacking in, in such basic things as they have difficulty writing a lesson plan, setting an objective, determining this is what I want my kids to come out with. Um, and from my experience, because I was, you know, we had our feet wet early on, and it, it was very effective. You know, we've heard several, a couple of comments uh, so far today on the internship program and looking at induction and the internship. I'll twist that a little bit and ask if any of you think that KTIP should not be changed. Okay. <laughs> but that's very informative. That's, a, that's very helpful to know. Well, I want to say the mentoring element of KTIP I think is very effective. Where you're working with a resource teacher and you have a team assigned to you, I think that's a really good um, format for a new teacher to be able to rely on at least three people. One with the university, one on the administration staff, and then one teacher, hopefully in the same area. Um, it's a portfolio that's kind of taken on a life of its own. Um, and Allie's not exaggerating when she says it's four and a half a five inch binder at this point that other than your resource teacher really doesn't get a lot of um, looking over by the committee because you don't have time to do that. Um, so I, I think the mentoring part of the intern program is really effective. I just might need to cut back on some of the paperwork or make it a two-year process. There's got to be another way to do it that doesn't put such a burden on the first-year teacher. Uh, did you have something on that? I did. Um, when I went through national board certification, it's a it's a year long progress or process. I'm sorry. That process, that one year, where we were given a mentor from our district, but that was our district. That one year, I learned so much more than I ever did going through KTIP. But it was basically the same idea. You learn as a teacher what your strengths are, how to improve those, and then what else do you need to improve? And you learn to do that by absolutely reflecting on what you're doing, why you're doing it, what data do you have to support what you think you did, what data do you have to support, what did the kids learn, what didn't they learn? And I would like to see Kentucky switch over and scrap K-tip Get rid of it. Start using national board certification 
as tenure. No more, well, I've taught four years, I've lasted this long, now I'm tenured. And, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, okay. no I was just, I think, I think more teachers would get more out of it, which in turn mean, would mean absolutely more students. Very interesting. Um, Let's talk about professions. I hate to go over it, but um, yeah. just an observation. If you took pieces of what the good stuff that each one of these fabulous teachers had and put them all together, then you'd have the ideal teacher preference. You just heard, so they're, they're actually having the system, parts of it, they've already experienced parts of the system that we want to develop. They're just bits and pieces. Right, don't, don't necessarily blow it up, just uh, share it there. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about professional development. Um, I'm not an educator. I, I work in this field a lot and talking to people about it. And one thing that I've heard consistently for several years now is that professional development, with exceptions, um, is either boring, a waste of time, counterproductive or non-productive. Again, there are exceptions. So, Allie, do you agree or disagree with that? <laughs> and okay. some thoughts on improvements. Um, I, I think that that is, um, I guess I agree and disagree. Uh, I think that professional development is something that um, we definitely need to look at as a, as a state and figure out what's working and what's not. Um, I think that if you ask any teacher, what would you like for professional development to be like? They will say they want to hear from people who are in the classroom or have a lot of experience in the classroom, people who um, have like activities or um, some type of, of practice thing that that teacher can use in their classroom the next day. Um, it needs to be something that is directly applicable to what they're actually doing because, I mean, even though, you know, you get a book on, I, don't, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but if anybody's done the four hats or the six hats, do you all know what I'm thinking about? I hope, I don't even know if people are still doing that, but it, it's like a, you know, the, the people wear different hats and, I mean, it was like a whole day of, of training about, um, you know, like you wear the red hat and the blue hat, and we were just like, what What are we doing here? And then, you know, six months later, we're like, you clean out your car, and there's, like, oh, there's a book in my trunk that I got at this training that has never been, oh, I can reuse that binder for something else. I mean, that kind of stuff, it's, it has to stop, because it's a, it's a waste of money, because districts are spending a lot of money to, to pay people to come and Teach, I mean, that's a that's a um, I would say a, a marketable thing um, is if you have something and you go to a school district and say, hey, I can teach every teacher here how to um, be a culturally responsive teacher, and they're like, oh yeah, here's some money and here's your whatever and go. And I think that it needs to be more practice based, and I think that it needs to be more opportunities like national boards. Like national boards actually is the best professional development activity that I ever did because it was about what I do every day and it was me looking at my classroom and saying okay well you know if, if I take myself for 15 minutes and then wash it which is awful but you know you have to do it you wash yourself and you can see like you know that kid really didn't get it and I kind of thought he was getting it but he's not if I really look at what's happening and and that is the kind of important stuff that teachers need to be doing and looking at and learning from other experienced teachers about what really works in the classroom. So the more opportunities like that where it's real and applicable, I think that that's great. But we want professional development. I mean, we want to learn, we want to get better. If, if you have something that you can tell me that I can do tomorrow that's going to make my kids learn more, I want to hear it, you know. And I think that we all, we want to hear it. It's just that we don't want to have our time wasted something that we're never going to be able to use. I don't know how the rest of you all feel about that. Well, I saw Kimberly nodding. Do you have I, I definitely agree with the points that Ali said. You want to be involved in professional development that's engaging, that's going to impact your, your teaching. You want to be able to take it back to your classroom 
and brag to other teachers like this is what I've learned. I mean, it, it's difficult to sit in professional development and you're thinking, oh, I could be in another session where I'm learning about this. So you want to have input on the sessions that you're going to because anything that impacts your teaching directly is going to be the most beneficial to you and to your students. So I definitely agree with, with what she said. Well, and I'm going to add something else. I think we miss a huge opportunity because every three years the classroom teacher is evaluated by their administrator. And in that session, the teacher and the administrator sit down together and they identify weaknesses that the teacher should improve on. But rarely do we get a chance to have our professional development meet those areas. That's just done on our own time because the professional development so often is driven by district or school goals. So those goals may not meet what my individual weakness is. Like, if I were gonna identify an individual weakness for me right now, it's social media. It's just, that's like talking voodoo. So I'm not gonna have that opportunity unless I go out and seek that on my own. And yet, if I were gonna identify that for my own classroom and a potential area that I haven't really tapped into, I would spend a day with somebody in technology learning how to do that. Uh, oh, we have a, I'm sorry. I was just going to add one little thing. And I think that, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. All right. Um, one opportunity that I think that we're missing is there are a lot of professional development nationally that happens, like in CTM, National Council of Teacher Mathematics Conference. And realistically, the the funding is no longer there um, in our districts for that kind of work outside of our school. And to me, that's something that um, I really think that we need to look at because I know that um, like, when I go to an AP conference in Vermont, you know, I learn from the best AP teachers that there are for AP calculus or whatever. And I think that those opportunities to, to travel and to meet people at our national organizations is really important. Um, and I would like to see more of that built into our, our funding, but I mean, so often we're told like, well, no, no. And so a lot of teachers actually will attend them, pay, they'll pay for it themselves is what happens, so. I'm curious, how involved, we have the state's two largest districts here, how involved are teachers in your district in planning professional development? We've been given more latitude the last three or four years. Before that, we really didn't have any input. By the last three or four years, we've been given the latitude to, within a department, identify PD needs and, as a whole department, try to meet some of those needs. But they're usually the big ideas. They're literacy or there's uh, differentiated instruction, things that will benefit the whole department. When you get down to the individual needs, uh, we don't have a lot of latitude there. Um, Pat, Buffy, Jefferson County, how much are um, I'm in a unique situation. I'm transferring to a new school this upcoming year, and we are in the final stage of the three-year process where we're becoming an inter international baccalaureate school. So we devoted 12 hours of PD this summer to uh, create some documents, for instance, our syllabus, and we had to align the uh, guidelines and principles for the International Baccalaureate with the curriculum in Jefferson County. And I was talking to a couple other people, that equated to 12 pages. So you send home a syllabus, six pages front and back, and you begin to wonder, mm, you know, parent, hopefully parents are going to read it, but how productive is that? Would that be something better that would be on a website where people could go, we'll say, the forest? Um, but that, that was very um, time well spent because it's something that we're going to need right out of the gate. And um, then from the, we spent one day working on that and then the second day we actually started working on units that fit, again, we're aligning our curriculum with the International Baccalaureate Guidelines. And that took a lot of work, working in the department by grade level. Um. But generally in the county in terms of teacher involvement and planning for professional development or suggesting it? Um, I've never heard of it. I received a, an email yesterday morning to let me know that I've been enrolled in two more PD classes. 
as part of your choosing. None of my choosing. So it was just here is not you. So I did ask if I could get paid, and he said no. I think another thing, like, it's not that teachers think that PDs are boring, but we have high expectations for professional meetings. If we take the time, especially like after school, you know, a three hour professional development, if we're all taking that time, which is away from our collaboration, like our, our regular stuff, apart, you know, that's time that we could have been used for contacting parents or whatever, we want to be wow. And we are, often you you sit and it's a lot of sit and get which is what we are constantly told we cannot do in our classrooms mm -hmm. so it's just that we have high standards when we attend things because we are te we're teachers and that's how we're looked at professionally <coughs> as you know how engaged is everybody well how engaged are the teachers in the professional development if the teachers aren't engaged in the professional development how can we ask the teachers to engage their students so uh, don't do as you do, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, talking a little bit, I know we're moving through these things fairly quickly. I do want to leave a few minutes at the end so the team members can ask some questions too. Um, but talking a little bit about working conditions, I know after Marianne and her colleagues worked for many years to bring this uh, further front in the policy maker's attention, the department uh, last year, uh, the Department of Education, um, conducted with the assistance of KEA and many other partners um, a survey of teachers uh, that really broke records in terms of response. It was a working condition survey. Um, the findings are now helping to inform other policy decisions, um, but it also, of course, had a very important effect of raising awareness of the impact of working conditions on um, teacher retention, among other things. And um, so I was just interested, and we'll start with you if we could this time, Pat. Um, just how extensive do you think the impact of working conditions is on a teacher's willingness to stay on the job and not be, excuse me, among that group I, of, that leaves within five years, okay. since you didn't. Okay, I think um, teachers are a rare breed. So let me say a friend, the biggest complaint that a teacher will, com will complain about is, I need to go to the restroom, <laughs> but you can only go at lunch <laughs> and planning. So the rest of the time, you, can, you gotta be careful because you can't get out of your classroom. But, the thing about teachers, we will work under terrible conditions because we're passionate about what we do if we can see that we're having an impact. Um, we need to have moving targets and we need good leadership. And I think if you've got that, we'll do it. We're going to hang in there. Kimberly, agree, disagree? I mean, working conditions and the impact. Working conditions play a big role in the retention of teachers. Um, you want to be within a school that has a strong administrative staff, high staff morale. Um, you want the support of teachers because you're essentially a community that works together. So you want to know that you have other teachers that I guess they kind of have your back and are, and are with you in everything. Um, gosh, <laughs> I mean. It's, it, it's, a, it's a big impact on, on your wanting to stay. You want to have resources that are available to you. Um, you don't want to have to to beg, I guess, to say, to find materials that you need to, to teach your kids what is necessary. So I think having all those combined at your school, it, it plays a big role in whether you're going to stay. You just want that support and you want to know that you're appreciated for what you do. And I think, yes, yeah, definitely the, the working conditions make a big difference. You know, you mentioned appreciated, and, and Allie and others have talked about um, elevating how the profession is perceived. Um, what are ways that people outside the education community could communicate to you all that you are appreciated? What sort of things? I mean, every now and then, I mean, is it an at a at a person? <laughs> is it? more money? Is it uh, public recognition? 
just some thoughts, Ali. I know that this is something that's very important to you. Is one of your five or six goals, right? Um, I mean, I think more pay um, is a, a part of that. But as teachers, we kind of we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot because <laughs> honestly, I would do it for probably half as much money. I mean, as long as I could. We won't go jump in. I know. <laughs> as long as I can afford to live and you know feed my cats or whatever. I mean, you know, I would um, I would still do it. And I think that's the problem with not that that's a problem, but that is a, a culture of our profession where we care so much that we will will take it when people say, okay, well, we're not going to pay you for that PD. We'll say, okay, well, it would have been nice to you know whatever, pay off this bill, but I'm still gonna go to that PD. And so it's something that, and it's hard for us to talk about, and I'm not really sure why that is, but it's, it's hard for me to talk about. I've never had a meeting with anybody where I've negotiated a salary or anything like that. Um, and, and that's just a hard thing for us to talk about. But I do think that until there are some extrinsic rewards, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we're gonna get there. I don't know how you all feel about that, but. Robin, I see you nodding. Um, well, I guess my thoughts on this are, uh, I think that higher pay may attract better new teachers um, because obviously when young people are trying to consider a profession, they're going to consider salary. <coughs> so I think on the front end, salary will attract young teachers. On the back end, for me, that's not why I stayed. I knew what I was getting into when I uh, signed on. Uh, I knew what the salaries were. I could look them up on uh, Fayette County website. I knew what I was going to make 20 years from now. So it wasn't the money. Uh, the working conditions, as long as I work in a school where um, the administration is supportive when I have a major problem, I don't need them in my classroom when I'm dealing with an unruly kid. I've got that. But when I have a huge problem, I need someone to say, okay, we can work this out. And someone to be supportive. And I think, I, I work in a school that that is absolutely something that I do have, so I feel really comfortable where I am. Um, I was in a unique position on the day that I interviewed with the school I work at now, I was actually called by another school and offered a position. And that school was, 10 miles closer to my home, but that school environment didn't seem and feel as friendly to me as the place where I accepted the job. And so I, I drive an extra 20 miles a day because I chose the school I work in because of the way it felt. And so that was important to me. Um, I think we've heard references to leadership and compensation and uh, a couple other things that encourage teachers to remain on the job. What else would either encourage or discourage a teacher to stay or leave? I think one of the things that is just across the United States right now is just betrayals of teachers. It's, you know, can, can you put us in a positive light sometime? You know, we're not all that bad teachers. You know, if, if given the chance and the resources, we could all be those super teachers. Very good point, very good point. Um, well, and you're talking about salary being important, to the, to especially to the new coming, incoming teachers. There's been a little talk of when you talk about longer term benefits, uh, retirement versus salary, and the you know the overall compensation package. Maybe for the incoming teachers, since they're not so worried about retirement at the age of 22, maybe you front load the salary and and worry about the benefits later, but the package is not quite, the benefit package isn't as generous as the salary package, if that makes any sense. I'd just be interested in your own thoughts about that, whether you think that's even feasible or worth pursuing or inequitable or unfair. Um, yeah, I see you, you were, I think you were I think, I think that's a bad idea. Bad idea, okay. Can you elaborate? Well, how do you expect, how do you expect, the, the inequity of it. How do you explain it? How do you get people to buy into it? If you're trying to attract um, higher quality candidate, it just it just doesn't 
doesn't ring with you. No, no, it doesn't. And I and I think compensation. People are motivated by different things. Um, what some some people may want compensation. Some people may want um, help with their tuition. For instance, my daughter. Um, just graduated from Tulane and, and is now starting medical school. Um, going to Tulane and the tuition cost, she could she could not afford to go into teaching. So this whole idea about how do we attract, if we if we assumed what they're doing in, in Finland, that would certainly help. That may have been a career choice that she would have opted for. Um, and this is something that we haven't talked about before, but it's sort of a segue into the so-called differentiated compensation. I think, uh, Pat, you made the comment that you knew when you, it might have been another one of you, and I apologize for my poor memory, but when you took the job, you knew the trajectory of your pay over the next 20 years, how it was. Right. Yeah. Um, but there's more and more talk now about not paying in that way, you know, differentiating the salary schedule based on a variety of factors. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on exploring that, if Kentucky were to explore that possibility, would that be a good thing, bad thing, unfair, fair? I'm really not sure. I know that there are states that have dabbled in that. They, um, a math or science teachers a little more um, because those are areas that's very hard to attract people in. Um, I'm not sure I would personally have a problem with that, but I would hesitate to speak for everybody because I know that even the AP grants that some of the schools have accepted, they're directed at math or science, and then teachers in the same school who teach social studies or English and they work just as hard as those other teachers don't get the benefit of bonuses because their students perform well when the math and science teacher sitting down the hall does. Um, again, personally, if you can get that bonus because your kids do well, great. But I know that that's not the voice of everybody that um, are in those that would be in those programs. I've, I've heard teachers who are very resentful of those programs. Um, for me, I understand that math and science, is, they're very difficult positions to fill. And uh, social studies teachers were a dime a dozen. So um, I recognize that I don't feel resentful, but I know there are many people who do. I think that's interesting because my first two years teaching, um, the school that I taught at, we got hazard pay and that's what we called it. You, we received a $2,000 bonus to finish our first year. We received a $1,000 bonus to sign on to start a second year. And then we received a $1,000 bonus to finish our second year. And the money was good. And it was at a time when we really needed it, brand new teachers. But it, it wasn't right. I mean, we were working just as hard as teachers in other buildings. And there were teachers that did not stay. You know, two thousand dollars a year bonus to work in a difficult school. So it was a hard to staff school. It was a hard to staff. School. Okay, so that's why you called it hazardous pay. Yes. Hazard pay, right? Hazard pay. Yeah. Sorry. Interesting. Um, I think you know. I think like I agree with Robin. Um, and by the way, you are one in a million. She's not done with us. Robin's a, been a mentor for me for a long time. Um, but anyway. I'm not quite sure, like her, how, how I feel about, you know, different subject areas getting paid more. But, like, I know that one thing that Kentucky could do to recruit and, you know, one thing, um, we, have to, we have to get a master's degree. Um, we have to start it within our first five years and finish it within ten. But there's no, there's no help that I know of for tuition for that. So teachers have to, um, and like, well, some, some schools, some um, certification programs, like at University of Kentucky, they're doing the, um, the, like the MIC program where the students get their masters when they student teach. But like for myself, I went to, um, to Transy, and so 
you know, I graduated with a bachelor's, and then I had to start my master's degree um, within five years, and then I had to do it after school and on weekends, and I had to pay for it myself. And to me, that's just, I, I guess I don't want to say that it's obvious, but it seems like that would be a great place to start, helping teachers, retain teachers, is to say, okay, we're going to help you a little bit with those tuition costs. Um, you do get tuition reimbursement when you have a student teacher, but you can't have a student teacher until you have a master's degree. So that doesn't really work out with that. But that would be a, a great place for Kentucky to start, I think, with that, some kind of help with that program. Well, that would be a business model because a lot of employers will pay tuition for the continuing education of their employees. Right. And, and I will say that my department lost a really bright young teacher because he could not afford to go back and get his master's. And, you know, I, I went and talked to him. I tried to persuade him. I offered to lend him some money. And he said, Robin, I can't even pay off my original student loans. How can I go more into debt to get my master's? I can't argue with that. He's right. I want to touch on um, teacher evaluation and then open it up for questions. Um, Barnett mentioned this in his um, presentation this morning to a degree. Um, just be interested in your all's opinion, assuming that a system is developed that is fairly administered. Um, should teacher evaluations be placed in, uh, be based in part on students' academic achievement in your view? Okay, can we start with you? I just like to go down the line on this one. I think the, the one thing that we need to look at is how far you've moved your student. If, and not by grade level, but by ability. If I get a kiddo in my classroom who can't read, or I'm sorry, is on a second grade reading level, and by the end of the year, he's on a fourth grade reading level. God, I moved that kiddo a lot versus Allie here who gets the AP kids. You know, she's already got a higher threshold to start with. So I think it's more about how much you've moved them, not where they end up at. But it makes sense. But yeah, sure it makes sense. But that then you think that would be fairly um, included in the evaluation of your performance. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sure, absolutely. Um, like I said earlier, I work hard every day, and I I want to be held accountable for for what I do and. Like Buffy said, that's the issue that I have with this thing about how many kids you have proficient. You know, she might move somebody from second grade to fourth grade. They're not proficient, but she still had serious success with that student, and that should be factored in also. Um, there are a couple of things that I'm a little concerned about, um, like what model are we going to use? How do we, how do we use growth? What assessments do we use? And then also, what do we do with the subject areas that don't have uh, assessments, like uh, you know, art, music, are they going to be, are they going to be evaluated based on what's happening in a math classroom? Like, I'm just not sure how that's all going to shake out here. So that's just a, a little concern that I have. But absolutely, I think student performance should be a part of your evaluation. Okay. I agree. Student performance should be a part of it. But I think we should also take into consideration the ability of the teacher to work with the team of stakeholders. For instance, Middle school, we work on teams, so all the teachers on the team, the parents, the administrators, the student themselves. And could we consider also how the teacher services the school? So I was thinking, um, you know, you, you know, people that show up, they come in at the last minute, they leave as quickly as they can. The quality of work, well, or maybe the enthusiasm that you bring, but you can't measure that. So in a broader term, the service. And, and the way the teacher delivers the service, are they enthusiastic? Do they go beyond? Do they, um, do they come early and, and teach a class, which I have done? Um, I called it early morning science class. Um, and, I, and I targeted it for students who weren't achieving. Um, but very quickly, some of my higher functioning students said, wow, it was like fun, I'm coming too. So I had, I had 35 kids at 7 o'clock in the morning. And we went from 7 o'clock to 7.30. 7.30, they were trotted off to class. Ms. Thurman, what are we going to do tomorrow in morning class? <laughs> so we'd go for four weeks and we'd take a break. And after four weeks, they're going, it's time for morning class again. So those are the kinds of things I'm thinking when I say 
the service and and what you know and moving on into the community outside of your building. Robin, I really do think that um, growth and student achievement for the year or longer should be taken into account when you're evaluating a teacher. Um, there are so many just variables in what makes a good teacher, and I have no idea how you're going to hit all those. Because um, I can think of several teachers in my, my own department who have a quality that bring, they're like magnets for kids, and you're not going to measure that on paper. You're never going to measure that. Those are the teachers who inspire kids. They may not be the same teachers who have the most growth and academic achievement in, the, in that year. I will argue that those teachers are as valuable to the school as someone who's really focused on academic achievement. So as this committee tries to figure that out, um, I wish you lots of luck. <laughs> because even in my own department, I cannot put my finger on what the missing quality is sometimes between those two teachers. And I think they're both very important. But yeah, academic achievement, absolutely, should I should be held accountable for that. And Kimberly will give you the last word on this. I agree with what everybody said on this panel. I mean, it's not just the growth and progress of what your students are have made, but I mean, there's a lot of factors that, that go into it. I mean, your interaction, your engagement, your delivery, the fact that you're using you know research-based best practices, all of that. I think it's taken into account when you evaluate a teacher. Great. Okay, we've got just a few minutes so we can take some questions from team members, unless we've adequately covered the waterfront for this afternoon. Yeah, Representative Rollins. I've got a question. The, uh, the different years, 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 the the student the greatest number of students in the most. How do you do that? If you can answer that, we'll let you know. Well, I, I, just, I just want to clarify that um, I don't teach all AP. Um, I do teach three sections of general algebra two, um, and I don't say general because who wants to be called general, you know? But um, that's a way to, you know, raise the bar. But So I don't use that word intentionally, but that's what it is. So I, I do teach low levels. Um, and the reason that I teach AP Calculus is not because I won some award, it's because nobody else would do it, quite frankly, because um, it's so much extra work. So I, I mean, I just want to make sure everybody, and I do think that that's a really important job of administrators is to make sure that your top teachers are teaching the kids who need you the most. And, or yeah. I think I said that right. And I, and I think that that does happen though. Um, and I think that, you know, every teacher has their strength. Um, I actually work better with lower level kids than I do with higher level, I will say that. Um, and so I actually prefer that level. And I think that every teacher kind of has their niche. And so I don't, I don't, I think that's a, a question like the school and the, the administration, whoever's doing the scheduling really needs to think about what is, where the teachers are really going to make the most impact, whether it's high level or low level, or I don't know. I just wanted to clarify that. I, I agree with Allie in and, and that administration has a hand in that and really needs to have a hand in that. I think every teacher should teach all levels. And now, having said that, nobody should have more than a couple preps. Um, I've seen teachers who have four preps. And so they're teaching four different classes that aren't related. It's very hard to prepare for that and stay on top of it. But if you can limit the preps, two or three at the most, and then have a multiple level schedule, I think that's ideal for everybody because no student gets shortchanged 
because you have a manu manageable schedule, but at the same time, the teacher benefits from not forgetting how the other half lives, and also the students benefit from having that really great teacher, whether they're high level or low level. So, I think it's Carl. Back to the differentiated pay, that first school that I taught at, we still had a huge turnover, even with $4,000 bonus. And the largest majority of that was due to a feeling of not being supported by administration. And there were many teachers there who stayed even after the bonuses were over with. It was a grant. So once the grant money was gone, they stayed because they did feel supported and I think it's probably the number one and tell me if you guys disagree the number one thing in teaching is if you feel like you have a supportive administration you'll do anything more. Roger Mark, if you had a question. I want to get back to the <clears throat> academic achievement as one of the factors in compensation and all of you said you were supportive of that if it was based on student growth at the time. And that's what we saw in the survey as well that uh, Barnett shared with us. The problem we've had in Kentucky and across the country is how do you measure that growth over time? <clears throat> and just a little bit of, of history here, we're back to primarily in this state on-demand testing, and Allie shared with us our concerns about that, taking a fourth of the instructional time. But we also tried portfolios at the beginning of reform, and having been around during that time as a high school principal, I remember the intent was to get away from on-demand testing completely and move into portfolios. So we're measuring and seeing student progress over time. And maybe we did it poorly because it started out with math and writing portfolios, and now neither of those really exist. But the intent was to go to that in all content areas. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that, those two approaches to measuring student progress over time and not necessarily how it turned out with the writing and math portfolio, but, but on-demand testing versus that type of assessment to measure student growth. Um, did you want to? I see. Um, I, it's, it's a um, more true indicator of what the students have achieved um, and that's one of the wonderful things about Common Core. Um, once you've done, we call it a module, but once you've done your series of lessons, um, then there's, there's, you have to demonstrate. Um, so the first one I did, I required my students to write a paper, and I'm all excited. I know they've got it. I just know they've got it. They didn't have it. <laughs> and I didn't know it until I read their work. And so specific things that they had to go into, so it was about kinetic energy. What was some evidence, and they had to base it on lab work that they'd done, uh, uh, you know, of, of kinetic energy. Things that I thought, they've got it. Again, when I read that in-depth writing, they didn't have it. So it really, it really opened my eyes, made me go back and look at some things that, that were, I was teaching, thinking, uh, and, and it was part of the, the, the program that we were using in Jefferson County. Um, but what that told me was some of the things that we were teaching was actually very confusing to them, and that was very apparent in their writing. Other comments? Senator, you have a question? Uh, before I answer, ask my question, Allie, I want to just say, uh, during your wonderful presentation, you gave several quotes, and one that I took home was you said that policymakers make sure teachers are allowed to help affect policy, and I think that's very important. I think this is part of that process, too, but I think that's a very uh, thing we need to remember. Uh, my question deals with the uh, help and pay tuition to get your master's and those types of things. Do you all think it's more important maybe not to have a master's but that is national board certification more important and we funded that. Uh, is that more important to you all? Do you think that would have more uh, emphasis or, or uh, more bearing on improving what you do? Yes. <laughs> um, absolutely. I think, <clears throat> okay. So um, 
when I got my, I apologize for y'all just jumped in there, but this is something I feel pretty strongly about. Um, when I got my master's, um, yeah, as I was teaching, I, I obviously my major was uh, teaching secondary math. Well, at the university where I got my master's, there wasn't a program for that, um, and there wasn't, there, there weren't even professors who could really help me with teaching math. So I took like a couple of science teaching math classes, a couple of elementary math teaching classes, but there really wasn't, um, there wasn't a master's program that fit me as a teacher. Now there are master's programs if you want to be an administrator or a curriculum specialist, and, and I think that for people who have a goal of doing those type of things, the master's degree is perfect. But if you are someone like myself who, I mean, I, I really want to be a teacher, the whole time I'm in this career, this is what I want to do. I don't have any, um, and it's not because I'm not thinking that I want to do anything more. It's just that I'm happy teaching and that's what I want to do. I think that there needs to be something for people like me. And National Boards was perfect because that, what I learned in National Boards, um, it, it was very um, applicable to what I was doing and my master's program really didn't give me that. Um, and it's not a fault of the university, it's just because that program just wasn't there. Um, so I think that providing more funding for national board, for teachers to become national board certified would be an excellent um, way to help teachers receive that, whatever the, the rank or whatever you have to get, rank two, I don't really know, to get your, yeah, to count as your masters. That would be an excellent idea. I don't know what you all think. Allie, I agree that I, when I did National Board, I learned much more that was applicable for my uh, classroom, and it, it absolutely made me a better teacher. I, I don't know that my master's made me a better teacher, um, but I'm going to say a couple things here. First of all, if you go that direction, you need to understand that half the people who apply for National Board fail the first time around, and only about 70% end up passing in the end, and um, that's even with mentors helping them. So you need to be prepared for, okay, what's our next step? Because now we have half of our population of teachers who didn't pass, and what are you going to do with that? And, and that may affect your funding. And then the second thing I'm going to say with that is national board. Um, right now, the state provides a stipend. It's less if you don't have your master's. So. The recommendation by National Board is that you have your master's before you actually apply for them. It, it affects the salary. So teachers may be reluctant still to not get their master's first. But maybe that's their own expense. Just, just heads up on that. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. We need to move on to our next segment. So please join me again in thanking our teachers. For with us today but for the wonderful work that y'all are doing every day we really appreciate you we appreciate you <laughs> um